Welcome back. My name is Jack Burgess. Today I want to talk about multi-level layout design. Back in the mid-1970s, there started uh, appearing in the model magazines plans for multi-deck layouts, uh, but no construction ideas, uh, no layouts that had already been built with multi-decks. I designed my layout in 1979, started construction in early 1980, and uh, from what I could see or, or read, I thought my layout was one of the very first multi-deck layouts. Turns out that Model Railroader Magazine staff got together uh, probably about that time or maybe a little earlier and Jim Hediger agreed to build a multi-deck layout. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't learn about it until many, many years later. And he didn't, as I recall, have any articles about it for quite some time. So I was up there very close to the start. I had several goals when I designed my layout. One of them was to duplicate the prototype that I have, Yosemite Valley Railroad, as closely as possible. And to do that, I wanted a really long main line. That would let me have towns that were far enough apart so you didn't have the problem of the engine in one town and the caboose in the other. When I started design, there was a lot of discussion about staging. And uh, people, I had several people review my layout and one of the comments was, you've got to have staging. And so I'd actually included staging on the design. Uh, so I had staging at one end with a reverse loop. Uh, I had some staging on the other end. But my prototype is not a traditional through railroad such as the Southern Pacific or one of those that picks up cars from one yard, takes them to the next yard, and passes them on to another railroad. And that's where staging is very, very important. So you can model those kinds of trains. My railroad started in one town and ended in another town 74 miles away. So there was no through traffic that was handed off to another railroad. Uh, everything was picked up in one yard and dropped somewhere along the line or at the other terminus. My layout room is actually uh, what in California we call a garage, two-car garage. So it's 20 by 20 space. When I started the layout, I didn't have a workshop. Um, so I actually took part of the space to build about a 6 by 12 workshop which left me basically with a 13 by 20 space. By going multi-deck, I have a, about a 235 foot long main line. So that is significant. And that to me was worth the uh, effort of going double deck. Now right here, this is the Merced Yards. Uh, this appears to be single deck right here, but actually behind this backdrop is the track that connects the, the, the first level to the second level. To better illustrate what I was just talking about, here I'm at the other end of the Merced Yard. Here's the track that comes out of a helix behind me, climbs up behind the backdrop on a 2.3% continuous grade through the curve and ends up on the second deck right here. This is a 14 inch separation. Uh, at that 2.3% grade, you need about 60 feet of track to get from this level to this level. I mentioned the helix. Uh, the helix is inside a, uh, this area to my right. Um, and there's a couple of things I could have done. One is to make the helix more than one turn, get the whole 14 inches by going up maybe two or three times and then coming out. Uh, the other option is what I did, which is a one turn helix, picks up about five inches, then it crosses the duck under, gets the rest of the elevation gain behind me on uh, Merced. One of the problems with helixes uh, and the, the uh, climbing section I have is your train is out of sight for quite a while. That's a problem that you really can't solve. You could, I know people have a helix and they make it visible just so you can see the train, make sure it's still running. When I built the layout, sound equipped engines were not available. And so I actually had a door viewer that I installed so that as the train was in this climbing helix, you could look in there and make sure the train is still moving because you're waiting and waiting for it to come out and you don't know. With sound, that's not such an issue. But one issue that I do have is the amount of time it takes to, to go into the first tunnel and come out here. And that takes quite a while. And during that time, no train, if one train's coming up, another train cannot be going down. Uh, my timetable accommodates that. But in a two hour operating session, there is only one time that another train could get into that section. The rest of the time, 
the, rest, the entire rest of the operating session, another one train is either going up or another train is going down in that section. One option you can consider is make the helix a double track helix. That way a train can be coming down and another train can coming up and that solves the problem. It takes more room, a lot more engineering and um, workmanship to get to pull that off. But I have a friend that had one and it worked really well. And he modeled the YV, double deck layout and so forth. One of the first challenges that comes up with designing a multi-deck lay layout is the separation between one deck and the next deck. Um, if you make this separation too small, you won't be able to see down here. If you make it higher, then this track may be so high that visitors or operators won't be able to see it. You'll also notice that the fascia is curving up here and on the bottom level as opposed to being straight. I did that intentionally. I wanted to have something that flowed, kind of followed the track. The track is curved, the fascia is curved, as opposed to having straight track on every wall and a curve at every corner. I also varied the width of them. You can see that this pulls in. This is, this is further out than this. One reason is because there's a bridge here which is very susceptible to somebody putting an elbow through it. So by having this, it actually is protecting that bridge. I'll show you a couple of other places that I've done that. This would be a good time to talk about the design of the second deck and how you're going to support it. What I did, because I have mountainous scenery here, is I cut three-quarter inch plywood into profile boards. So you basically have a lever arm from here to here this piece of plywood comes down, the scenery is touching it, and comes down and it supports the wood that's supporting the track itself. If the second level is flat, this profile board is not really an option. What some modelers have therefore used is steel angle, and they can put it from here up, supports it from underneath, and then the backdrop hides the steel from view. This is the town of Merced Falls. This is a major switching area. There was a lumber mill here. Log trains would come in like this one right here uh, and drop the loaded log cars and so forth. So in this area, I took the upper deck and pushed it way back. You've got to be able to have operators get in here and uncouple cars and so forth and see what they're doing. So uh, pushing this back, uh, this is all just scenery. There's nothing going on up here. So this worked out really well. This is town of Bagby. This is another section that I pulled out the um, front to protect the stuff below, which is a couple of bridges and a fence. Also though, the track here curves and that's exactly how the prototype curved. So um, I wanted to include that and, uh, and make everything fit. That brings up the other issue of lighting. I didn't even think about lighting the, the first deck when I was designing my layout, nor when I got started. I actually built all the bench work, laid all of the uh, plywood to support the track, and then started laying track, um, working both at the lower level and the upper level. And the lower level, and all the track is hand laid, so that we're not talking flex track here. And I laid all of this track on the first deck uh, without any problems at all. No extra lighting, whatever. Um, but then when I started putting the scenery on the upper deck, I suddenly realized the problem. I needed to have some lights here. So what I ended up doing was using 18 inch lights that were called under counter lights that you could put in the kitchen, put them under the upper cabinet to light the area. And they tend to work well. They're balanced for the lighting in the rest of the room, except they are no longer made and uh, it's a, a unit, it's not a replaceable bulb. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do when one of these goes out because I had two or three spares and I've used them. I, I'm not out here much, I don't turn these lights on except when I have visitors, so maybe they'll last a long time, I don't know. But it's a real concern. Uh, if I do have to do that, I'm gonna have to go to some kind of LEDs that match the cool whites that I have in the rest of the room. I wanted to include this little detail on my layout because it shows up in several photos. I don't know what it was. I think it was for track tools and spikes. Photos show the, a complete crossing laying over here, I think, or one of the, one of the quadrants. Uh, so in case 
some dragging equipment, damage this crossing, they could get a crew out, they would have all the tools they need, and they could put it back in place. But I have kept having people knock the box over. Here's the solution. There's just a little weight in there, it goes right back in, no one can damage it. When I designed my railroad, I wanted to include the interchange between the YV and the Southern Pacific, which was in Merced, which is what I've done on this level right here. Uh, my thought was I would have an operator that would actually do what the YV did, which was take or come into the, the SP, pick up loads or empties that were needed, and take them up to the yard, uh, the YV yard. Um, in reality, we don't do that. Um, I think it would be kind of a boring task. It wouldn't take that long. Everybody else is running trains from one end of the railroad to the other. So this is basically not used at all. Uh, this is on the second level. This is the Y. The trains that come up here do turn on the Y and so forth. This top layer is um, the logging, which I also wanted to include. And the YV had a, an incline at the town or the location of incline. And I wanted to actually have somebody operate the incline, bring empties up, take loads down or lower them, and bring have a train that would come out here and so forth. I actually bought a Shea that's maybe been run about uh, two hours max because we don't do that. I was going to have somebody be on a stool here and could run this. Never happened. I don't think anybody would like doing it. Um, so this is, uh, this actually was built as a contest model and then lifted up here when it was all finished. But um, it's never been used. One of the things I just could not avoid when I was designing this layout was a duck under. What I did, first of all, is initially this was all portable track, or removable track, uh, so that, in fact, uh, this was too at that time, so that I could, all the time I was building bench work and doing those kinds of chores, those were taken out, so I didn't have a duck under during construction. Uh, it wasn't until I was all the track was in and I was doing scenery and so forth and I finally locked this in place. This was the main duck under. If it had been this high it would have been a, a knot under but this is a serious duck under. So I had to compromise between what height do I want to have the tracks at Merced and the higher those were the less the duck under. But there's a limit to how high I can have those and still have the rest of the, everything else work. So this was a compromise. So what I did, first of all, I made this as narrow as possible so it's not a crawl under, and second, I made the track down here as narrow as possible and as thin as possible. So this is constructed with a simple piece of half-inch uh, aluminum angle on both sides and homosote. There's no plywood under there, again, to get this up as high as possible. It minimum, very minimum clearance between here and the water above it. A uh, little flip down door so if I have a derailment or I need to clean the track, I can get in there. This conductor back here, that is carrying wires up to a, 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 a switch. So there's actually a turnout under here which was built and then this thing was put in place and bolted down. So right here we actually have four decks. One here which goes from Merced into a reversing loop, one here, one here, and then the logging at the top. This is El Pertel. This is the end of the line. This is the only section of the layout that is truly single deck. What we're standing in right now is actually where my shop used to be. It extended from right about here to this wall and back uh, about 14 feet from this wall. So this was my shop. It was actually a portable shop. I was renting the house at the time, so the walls were all portable. Could take them down. The bench work was all portable, but it gave me a place to build models. One of the things I wanted to do on my layout, and it kind of evolved, is colors. Uh, I started this on a previous layout that was in the same space, and I painted the walls yellow because the grass is yellow in California in the summer. And I thought having the walls reflect the color, the main color of the layout would help and it would amplify that. The same idea was transferred to the color of the fascia. Some people like black. There's a lot of people that argue fascia should be black because it disappears and that's what they do uh, on stage is 
things will be black and the audience will ignore them. I never tried black. I have a friend that has his is dark green. It works well. I wanted a color that you would you wouldn't even notice. I don't want I want people that are here and they're operating or other visitors to be looking at this and not looking at the fascia. So I want the fascia to blend in. So the fascia is just about the color of the dirt. Uh, that seems to work well. Many years ago, my wife, after I got all the plaster work done, said that we should carpet this area. And so we actually installed very high-end um, living room type carpeting with pads. And it really helps. It, it seems like it's um, extravagant. But if you're standing out of here for two or two and a half hours operating, being on a nice carpet with padding is much nicer than standing on concrete. And so the color of the, con or the carpeting also reflects the colors. So part of the overall goal, and maybe it's a goal that really can't be achieved or one that I'm just imagining, but when people operate on my layout, what I want them to do is after a, an operating session, feel like they were actually in August 1939 running a train from Merced to El Portel. Uh, so I want all of the distractions to be gone. I don't want them to be seeing stuff stored under the layout or piles of kits. I want all that stuff to be gone. And the only thing they're want, looking at is this. They're not looking here. They're not being distracted by here. So that was my goal. I achieved it to my, my satisfaction because I feel as a visitor, you walk in and you see a finished layout and everything is done. So um, that's very satisfying to me.